The Big Story. Amy, what have I done? Amy. I heard a shot, sir. What have I done? Oh, what have I done? What's the matter, sir? My wife, look. Shall I call the police, Mr. Hodge? Yes. Is she dead? She must have died instantly. The shot blew half her head off. Youngstown, Ohio. From the pages of the Youngstown Vindicator, the story of a reporter who made a hunch pay off. Youngstown, Ohio. The story as it actually happened. Bill Griffith's story as he lived it. The first chill wind of autumn slaps you across the face, Bill Griffith, reporter on the Youngstown Vindicator, as you leave your home that morning, late in October. You hurry to your office, not because you're late, but because you know there's a hot story waiting, made to order for you. The big jewelry store robbery downtown. But you never get to that job, because there's something else that happens. It's so big that the boss himself is in your office waiting for you. Oh, oh, hiya, John. Don't take your hat and coat off. Okay, okay, I'll get right over. They get much? I'm not putting you on the jewelry job. Lawson's going to cover it. Oh, why Lawson? You heard of Clive Hodge? Sure, sure, the big mining millionaire. What's the matter with him? Nothing with him. It's his wife. He just blew her head off accidentally. Get down there fast. I'll try to hold the blue edition till I hear from you. I'm on my way. When you get to the Hodge mansion, Gould, the secretary, suave and courteous, shows you into the huge library. There you see Detective Bromley and a couple of his men sitting around and listening to Mr. Hodge. You've seen Mr. Hodge many times, but never like this. He's slumped in his chair, tortured and dazed. He keeps shaking his head in horror, as if trying to shake the remembrance away. It was after dinner, Detective Bromley. Amy was resting on the love seat. She hadn't been feeling well, hardly ate her dinner. How did you happen to have a shotgun in the library, Mr. Hodge? We were nearly robbed the night before. Uh I had an old shotgun in the storehouse. I carry it for protection. I, I don't know why I did that. I, I never shot this gun or any gun for that matter. Go on. Well, she, she fell asleep on the chair. She, she looked so uncomfortable, I decided to wake her up. We get her to go to her room. I, I prodded her with a gun. It went off. I never even dreamed it was loaded. Uh, how far was the gun from her head? About ten inches at most. It was the most awful thing. You look around the room, Bill Griffith. Beautifully furnished, clean. You look at the love seat, a large stain on the side of it, and on the rug. Someone had already tried to clean it. Since the accident, someone had been in this room cleaning it up. Even the ashtrays. You wonder, what was the hurry... You get up and think maybe you can look around the mansion, maybe talk to a couple of the servants. Where are you going, sir? Oh, just, uh, just looking around, Mr. Gould. Oh. Any objections? Oh, no, sir. Go ahead and look all you like. No, sir, they got along fine. It was always darling and dearie and honey. They've been on a perpetual honeymoon for ten years. Oh, mister, you're looking for something that isn't there. Well, to tell you the truth, I won't lie to you. They did have one spat. Uh, That was two years ago, less than uh, three weeks, about two months after I came here. (laughs) Mr. Hodge was real considerate of her. Not like some of the men that walk around these days. He made up to her. When they were alone in their room, he'd give her a pearl necklace and kiss her behind the ear. I couldn't always hear what they said, but, uh, well, they always got along swell. I never saw them quarrel, but 
Then I'm just the gardener. I never did see them much at all. Lucy could tell you more. She was poor Mrs. Hodges' maid. Where can I find her? She went back home. She was fired this morning. Uh, yes, sir. Miss Lucy, I'm Bill Griffith from the Youngstown Vindicator. May I come in? Oh, oh sure. I uh, want to talk to you about Mrs. Hodge. It was a terrible accident, wasn't it? It was horrible. Why were you discharged so soon? I don't know. M Mr. Gould gave me two weeks' salary and told me there was no need for my services. How did Mr. Hodge and his wife get along? Not too good. They quarreled? No, but he didn't like her. He didn't? How do you know? Well, I... Hey, I don't want to get mixed up in this. I, I got nothing more to do with Mr. Hodge, and... I'd rather forget the whole terrible business. Did you like Mrs. Hodge? She was real nice and sweet to me. Always gave me a few extra dollars over my salary. He's an old skin flint, he is. Wouldn't you want to help in case it wasn't an accident? We, you think he... I don't know. I'm trying to find out. Why didn't he like his wife? Uh, well, he, he had a friend. Girlfriend? Yes. What's her name? It's Madge Carey. She lives over in Belrose. Did Mrs. Hodge know about her? Yeah, but she never let on. Well, Mrs. Hodge was a very unhappy woman. You know, she once told me that if anything ever happened to her, for me to look behind the Ruald. I, I never knew what she meant by that. Well, Ruald is a painter. She probably has one of his pictures hanging in a room. It'll be very interesting to know what's behind that picture. <laughs> Now you have a fistful of leads, Bill Griffith. But you're not ready to go back to the office. Not yet. You want to have a look at the body. I'm sorry, Bill, but I got instructions not to let anyone look at the body. Mr. Hodges' orders. Why? He doesn't want anyone to see her the way she is. I can't blame him. A shotgun makes an ugly mess. Okay, okay. Just tell me where the powder marks are. Powder marks? There aren't any. Well, there must be. The gun went off ten inches from her head... I'm telling you, there are no powder marks. Are you sure? Look here, Bill. I've been a coroner and a mortician for a long time. I work with the police. I know about these things. I'm telling you, there aren't any powder burns. I'm telling you, absolutely. What the devil happened to you, Bill? Am I too late for the blue edition, boss? We put that to bed an hour ago. What did you get? Boss, the story was too good. The house is too clean. Everything's too perfect for my taste. So I did a little snooping. And? And now I'm a wiser man. I don't know all the answers. But I certainly picked up a lot of questions that should be answered. Like what? There's only one thing fit to print right now. And that is, why are there no powder burns on Mrs. Hodge since the gun went off ten inches away? It's just not possible. Let's keep asking that question. And I have a hunch we'll come up with the answer. But even though the Vindicator hammers away for days on the absence of powder marks, the police decide that it was accidental homicide. But you, Bill Griffith, aren't satisfied with this decision. You go ahead with your investigations and make some phone calls. You try to see Madge Carey, Hodge's girlfriend. But she's away for the weekend. You try to get into the Hodge mansion to take a look at the Ruald painting. But Mr. Gould won't let you get any further than the front door. You're getting nowhere fast until one of your phone calls pays off. Yes? Well, this is Cliff. Oh, hiya, Cliff. Got anything for me? Money. After you called, I checked through our policies. Spill it. Clive Hodge insured his wife in New York about a year ago for fifteen. Fifteen thousand? But that's not the half of it. He put in a claim for the dough two days after her death. Well, isn't that a loving husband? Don't go away yet. He even went to the trouble of claiming and collecting a hundred dollar burial fund because his wife was once a government nurse. You know what? I'm beginning to have a feeling that Mr. Hodge didn't like his wife at all. <laughs> Yes? Am I speaking to Mr. Griffith? 
Yes, who is this? I'm Mr. Gould, secretary to Mr. Hodge. Oh, yes, yes. Would you oblige me by coming down to see Mr. Hodge at your earliest convenience? Okay, I can come down this afternoon. Thank you, he'll be waiting for you. Oh, uh, come in, please, Mr. Griffith. Hello, oh, Mr. Hodge. Mr. Griffith, your paper has apparently been on a crusade against me. I suppose it makes good copy for your readers. We're merely asking that someone answer the question we're asking. You uh, mean about the lack of powder burn? That's right. <laughs> I wish I knew the answer. There are a couple of other questions that have been bothering us. Oh, I'd be very glad to answer any questions at all. You're a close friend of Madge Carey, aren't you? Who told you that? Well, what difference does it make? I know her slightly, that's all. Seems strange that you should buy her a new automobile if you know her slightly. That was just a business to you. You also applied for a collection on your wife's insurance two days after a fatal accident. My business manager, he probably took care of that. I had no idea that he made applications so soon. You also collected a $100 burial fund three days after her death. It's hard for some of the people in my office to consider that an act of deep mourning. Mr. Griffith, I don't care what your paper thinks. If necessary, I'll put a stop to these ugly stories, and I can do it, too. You can go back to your editor and tell him that I'll break your paper if he doesn't leave me alone. Now, you get out of here. On your way out, you pass Amy Hodge's room. The door is slightly ajar. The rule, the painting. You step carefully into the room, Bill Griffith, and close the door. You look on the walls. There it is. The rule of painting. You have to stand on a chair to get at it. You take the picture off the hook. And you look behind it. There's a piece of paper stuck into the back of the frame. Take the paper. Huh? What are you doing here? Well, I, I uh, was just admiring your pictures, Mr. Hodge. You were snooping. Didn't I tell you to get out? Well, I was on my way out when I, uh, when I saw this picture. But before I throw you out, hand me that paper. That paper, Mr. Griffith? I found it by accident behind the painting. It reads, I'm afraid of my husband. It's a woman's handwriting. Oh, you're not leaving here. I'm going to call the police and have you arrested for breaking into my wife's room. You're very confident, Mr. Hodge. But don't depend on that good conduct ribbon the police gave you. They might take it away. I know you're a powerful man around these parts, but so is the Vindicator. It usually lives up to its name. Avenge and justice. If you're guilty, believe me, we'll find you out. <laughs> Cy Harris, returning it to your narrator, and the big story of Bill Griffith, as he lived it and wrote it. You, Bill Griffith, reporter for the Youngstown Vindicator, are now standing in the bedroom of the late Amy Hodge. Her husband has just called the police in what you think is a bold bluff. When they arrive, Hodge tells them the entire truth, how he invited you how you violated his hospitality. And then he gives him the note you found behind the painting. He's so straightforward about it that you begin to have doubts about your convictions. The police let you go, but they don't like your meddling, and they tell you so in no uncertain terms. And now you have one lead left, Madge Carey, Mr. Hodge's girlfriend. Who is it? William Griffith. What do you want? I'd like to speak to you, Miss Carey. What about? I'm a reporter. Well, what do you want to see me about? About Mr. Hodge. You know him very well, don't you? What business is that of yours? Miss Carey, I can print what I think, or I can print what you tell me. I think you'd be better off if you answered a few questions. What are you dragging me into this for? You're a good friend of Mr. Hodge, aren't you? Yes. Very good, huh? Yes, very good. You love each other, don't you? Of course not. He's a married man. Why did he buy you that car? Well, because he likes me. We're good friends. Can't you understand that? No, I can't. 
I can't understand a young, pretty woman like yourself being such a close friend of a man in his 50s. Are you making insinuations? You were seen kissing him. That's a lie. I can prove it. Well, I might have kissed him once in, in friendship. Nothing else, just friendship. Now, please get your foot out of the door. I have nothing else to say to you. You didn't get very far with her, Bill Griffith. And now you have nothing else left to go on. You go back to your office planning to give this case up. But there's someone waiting for you. Hi, Bill. Remember me? Why, Ed? Vizi, what brings you here? I haven't seen you in months. Well, naturally, as a ballistics expert, I've been reading your articles in the Hodge case. Mm -hmm. I think you're quite right about it. There should have been powder burns in the body. Yes, I know, but it hasn't got me anywhere. Well, look, I've just talked to the coroner. He swears that there were no powder burns. But I'm quite willing to testify that the shot could not have been made at ten inches without leaving burns. You are, Ed? I am. Ed, that's terrific. I also took the trouble to go over the coroner's report. The great area of the wound couldn't possibly have been made by a shot fired at ten or fifteen inches away. It had to be a lot farther than that. Ed, if you can prove that, I think we can get the new prosecutor to reopen the case. Well, if you'll all come down to the Culver Valley Hunting Club, I can demonstrate it to everyone's satisfaction. <laughs> Look, Bill, I've only been prosecutor for a short time. The case is officially closed. The verdict is accidental homicide. Why should we reopen it now? I've got a lot of reasons why this case should be reopened. One of them is this sworn statement by Mr. Vesey, a ballistics expert. Here, take a look at this. All right, all right. Mm -hmm. Well, suppose it wasn't fired at ten inches. What difference does a few more inches either way make? The difference was more than a few inches. This means that Mr. Hodge was lying. It means that he wasn't prodding his wife with a gun to awaken her. It means that he was far enough away to take aim and murder her. You say that Mr. Vesey can prove it? Yes. He's willing to conduct a series of tests down at the Culver Valley Hunting Club. All right, I'm willing to be shown. There's, uh, there's one more thing. Like what? I'd like you to ask Mr. Hodge to come down. <laughs> He'll never do it. From what I know about him, I have a hunch he will. Two days later, everyone involved in this case assembles at the Culver Valley Hunting Club in the Target Room. And as you had expected, Bill Griffith, Mr. Hodge and his secretary, Mr. Gould, are present. Mr. Hodge seems calm even nods pleasantly to you when you happen to catch each other's eye. The atmosphere is more like a college lecture hall than a hearing in which a man's life hangs in the balance. I uh, want to thank you, Mr. Hodge, for being so cooperative. Well, Mr. Prosecutor, I am as anxious as I hope all of you are to get this tragedy cleared up once and for all. Yes, let's proceed and get this finished as fast as we can. Go ahead, Mr. Vesey. Gentlemen... I have here the same shotgun which caused the fatal accident to Mrs. Hodge. Is that the gun, Mr. Hodge? I suppose so. I'm not very familiar with guns. I, I guess it is. It's loaded. Mr. Hodge said he gently prodded his wife with the gun that went off. Is that so, Mr. Hodge? Yes, it is so. I'm going to take the same gun and pound it on the floor. And now I'm going to hammer it and knock it. It's facing me, you notice. It goes off. The shell will hit me. You see, the shotgun didn't go off. I wasn't being dramatic by pointing it at me. I did this only to prove that this gun can't possibly go off unless you press the trigger and press it hard. You might do that once too often, sir. You can hammer it on the floor a thousand times and it won't go off. The thousand and first time it might fire. Mr. Vesey, yes? do you consider it impossible for the gun to go off without pulling the trigger? Nothing is impossible, Mr. Griffith, but it's so unlikely that I was quite willing, as you saw, to point the gun at myself while pounding and hammering it. Uh, do you have any other tests, Mr. Vesey? Well, Mr. Prosecutor, I've brought here a slaughtered pig. Uh -huh. I'm going to fire the shotgun at it from a ten-inch distance. Will you people move to this side? Surely. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Notice that the hole in the body of this pig is no bigger than the size of the shell, a half inch in diameter. Notice the powder marks around the wound. Notice the waddings around the shell have followed the shot into the wound. Is the coroner here? Yes. Was there any wadding of the shell in the wound that killed Mrs. Hodge? 
No, there wasn't. Do you want to say anything, Mr. Hodge? Uh, yes, yes, indeed, Mr. Prosecutor. Uh, I would merely like to say that I had no idea there was going to be an accident, and I didn't measure the distance the gun was from her head. It might have been more or less. I, I was so dazed by what happened that my sense of distance might easily have been distorted. Well, that's very true, but I haven't finished this experiment. Please let me go on. Go ahead. The shell of a shotgun is different from a rifle bullet. A bullet makes the same hole no matter what the distance. But a shell hole is larger the farther the weapon is from the target. The shot spreads. Now, I'll fire the shotgun at a distance of three feet from target. The wound is now much bigger, as you can see, a little bigger than the silver dollar. But now I'd like to ask the coroner a question. Yes? The wound that killed Mrs. Hodge was bigger than the silver dollar, wasn't it? Yes, much bigger. If I'm not mistaken, according to your report, the wound was about three by two inches or uh, roughly about the size of a closed fist. Now that's about the size, Mr. Griffith. All right, I'll now fire the shotgun. I, I, I don't know what you expect to prove by if that. If you'll allow me to finish, I'll point out to all of you the significance this of this. This experiment seems most unfair to me, very prejudicial against me. Allow me, me to finish, uh, Wait please. a moment. Why do you think it's prejudicial, Mr. Hodge? Oh, Mr. Prosecutor, he's firing into a dead body. There's a great difference between the resistance of a dead body and a live one. Oh. The size of the wound would therefore be very different. Well, there is a difference, but so small as not to be measurable. For all intents and purposes, the shell makes the same size hold the naked eye in a live or dead body. I refuse to accept this. We can carry on the same experiment with a live animal if necessary, but I deplore the unnecessary use of slaughter to prove it. I object to these experiments. Mr. Veazey, you may continue with this experiment. Thank you, Mr. Prosecutor. I will now fire the shotgun from a distance of eight feet. Notice the wound. About the size of my closed fist. About the same size as the wound that killed Mrs. Hodge. This is a ridiculous experiment. The coroner can easily verify that this was the size of the fatal wound. I object to this whole procedure. Uh, quiet, please. Coroner? Yes, that was about the size. The shot was fired at Mrs. Hodge from a distance of eight feet, which meant that he took deliberate aim. There can be no other possible explanation. Would you like to comment on this, Mr. Hodge? Well, the whole thing is a lie. Griffith, your newspapers are just trying to make a lurid story out of this tragic accident. You have anything else to say, Mr. Hodge? Well, I'm innocent. I, I, I love my wife. We never quarreled. I, I wouldn't kill her. I, I wouldn't harm a hair of her head. I, I loved her. Mr. Hodge, we know about Madge Carey. So what? We know about the note which I found behind the Ruol. Well, that doesn't prove anything. My wife was eccentric. You insured your wife a year ago for $15,000 and put in a claim for the money two days after her death. I told you, my business manager you did that. You even collected a $100 burial fund on your wife three days after her death. I don't see what all this has to do with the situation. I think the combination of all these things adds up to a motive. And certainly this demonstration has proved that... I tell you, I didn't kill her. I'm sorry, Mr. Hodge. The state now considers you under suspicion of the murder of your wife, Amy Hodge. You are now under arrest. Now we read you that telegram from Bill Griffith of the Youngstown Vindicator. Suspect in tonight's big story was brought to trial. His suavity and polish and his calm demeanor did not fool the jury. He was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment in the Ohio Penitentiary. And so ends another big story. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic big story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed, with the exception of the newspaper reporter. The Big Story has been a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. <laughs>